Our first award goes to a person who was a colleague of mine when I taught with my friend Ed Mazur at City College of Chicago, a very famous individual with this city who, will, who is the recipient of the Gwendolyn Brooks Award for Achievement in Arts and Letters. He is a grand man with a great history of his own, Chicago's very own Professor Timuel D. Black. Professor Black. Take your hand, Tim. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. On behalf of the City Club, I'm proud to present this award. It's all yours. Well, thank you very much, Paul, and I'm not going to take any time. I know that everyone here is so aware of the City Club uh, programs and adventures, and on behalf of my lovely wife, Zenobia Johnson Black, and myself, I feel so honored to have this opportunity, and I'm grateful for having this award given to me by one of the great institutions in the city of Chicago at this event. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you very much. It's now my pleasure to introduce a person who will introduce the next award recipient, uh, the man who obviously needs no introduction, an individual who is now moving into my business writing political history, the fighting alderman of the 14th Ward, Ed Burke. Thank you, Professor Green, and uh, may I correct a mistake that the prior speaker uh, aired in. Uh, Jay, can I take the uh, opportunity to introduce your beautiful wife who is about to give birth to your lovely child on July 1st, uh, Jay's lovely wife, Colleen. Colleen, why don't you stand up? Where are you, Jay? Why did you do that? And it's hard for Jay to, to miss anyone, but he also missed the distinguished representative of the United States Congress, Representative Bill Lipinski, and Judge Rosemary Lipinski. All right, now you can cross those off your list. Ladies and gentlemen, Chicago's march towards greatness over our history has been galvanized by two remarkable local enterprises which can be said to be the very making of our city. Local politics and our board of trade. Each delves deep into the very heart of our urban character. Each has evolved out of our prairie passions for self-governance and economic development. In our city's history, Few have been more thoroughly a part of both enterprises than Thomas R. Donovan. As a young man from Bridgeport, that enduring piece of Chicago real estate that has produced five Chicago mayors, Tom served as the top aide to two of them. In 1971, Tom began a career in public service with the late Mayor Richard J. Daley. Tom's advice was solicited, respected, and very often heeded by one of the great architects of modern American urban governance. Chicago still experiences the genius of Mayor Daley's wisdom. Following the death of the mayor, Tom continued to serve the citizens of Chicago, and Mayor Michael Bolandic, where once again his collaboration helped to keep Chicago 
a vibrant metropolis. After leaving city government, Tom began an equally outstanding career at the Chicago Board of Trade. First in 1979 as executive vice president and secretary of the exchange, and then from 1982 to 2000 as president and chief executive officer. In addition, he also served as president and CEO of Mid-America Commodity Exchange. He brought with him to the trading floors of the exchange the same efficiency, effectiveness, and creativity that characterized his tenure in city government. The electric open outcry introduced by Tom Donovan brought a new standard of effectiveness to the Chicago Board of Trade. Today, Tom is the chairman of Quantum Crossings, and in addition, he serves with distinction on the boards of directors of several Chicago enterprises and lends his support to so many worthy causes. It is no understatement to say that Tom Donovan's influence on Chicago has been both far-reaching and long-lasting, always with a quiet effectiveness and a self-effacing dignity. As his friend, I am very proud to be able to introduce him to you tonight. His Chicago pedigree is without equal. Ladies and gentlemen, Tom Donovan. Thank you uh, very much. My good friend, as you can tell, Eddie Burke, a great public official and a true humanitarian. Thanks also to the City Club, Jay Doherty, Tom Roser, Paul Green for this honor and including me in this distinguished company. But this award tonight is not about me. Quite frankly, it's about opportunity. Opportunity given and opportunity received. I wouldn't be here this evening if I wasn't the recipient of great opportunity. Eddie spoke of Mayor Daley, and he was fond of saying, no man walks alone. That was so true. But also, there are no self-made men or self-made women. If anyone has any measure of success, it's founded in someone reaching out and giving them a helping hand. I've been very fortunate in my life. I've had a lot of people help me. But no one helped me more than Richard J. Daly. And the late mayor, for whatever reason, took me under his wing as a very young man. He gave me tremendous opportunity. He gave me the chance to work for him. But more importantly, he gave me the chance to work with him very closely. And. Most of us know Mayor Richard J. Daley as a great political leader and a great mayor. I knew him that way and in many more ways. I knew him as a man of warmth and caring and understanding and compassion. I knew him as an honest, moral man with great integrity. I knew him as a man who would help someone who was down without any thought of ever being repaid or getting a word of thanks. I knew him as a loyal man, someone who was loyal to his friends. When they really needed help, he was there. But more importantly and most importantly, I knew him as a mentor and a teacher. And he taught by his example, more by deeds than by words. And the opportunity that he gave me to be with him and learn from him, I couldn't have received if I got a PhD from Princeton, Harvard, Yale, U of C, and Notre Dame all combined. It was an opportunity that I wish each and every person could have. And as I stand before you tonight, I think of the mayor, and I only hope that he had a good pupil. I hope that I learned some of the qualities that he had, 
And I hope that at some point in my life and in some small way, I was able to pass on some of the opportunity to others that he has given to me. As Eddie said, I've been blessed. I've had great positions. The mayor's office for 10 years, the Board of Trade for 22 years. In those positions, you do have an opportunity to help people. I hope that I've done it, and I hope more than that, I've taken the time to mentor some people, to visit with them, to give them some advice and counsel if they want, and do it based upon the experience that I got working with a great man. You know, life is very short, and we're all very fortunate. And in the end, all we have is our good name, our family, and our faith. And it's important that we not lose any of them. So I'm blessed. I'm blessed with many good friends in this room. So many of you could be standing here this evening and one day in the future. I'm certain Jay and Paul and the City Club will tap you to be here. But I'm blessed because I've got good friends. I want to thank you for being here tonight to honor me and all of these recipients. I want to thank my lovely family, my great wife, Vita, who is my greatest supporter and my most <clears throat> and, and along with my children, my fairest critics. So thank you very much, City Club. I appreciate this honor. Thank you. All right. I figured the alderman would come with a prepared remarks. Uh, by the way, where is that congressman from Oklahoma? I heard that. Keep your, keep your cool. This could be in your district. Redistrict isn't that far away. OK. Uh, you never know. We've got some map makers in here who make Rembrandt look like a, you know, amateur. Miss, don't ask. I don't know. Uh, our next award, uh, in a very serious note, and our honoree is going to uh, speak a little bit about it. This is the first year, unfortunately, this is the first year we're offering this award, giving this award. I don't think I have to tell anybody in this room what it meant to the City Club to have former Sun-Times columnist Steve Neal as not only our ally, our friend, our member, but as an inspirational person intellectually in every other way. And so tonight we are instituting an honor of excellence in journalism in his name. And it's really a uh, mixed blessing because uh, uh, I digress for 30 seconds. If you could have seen the times that Steve Neal talked before the City Club pushing one of his books or bringing Professor Bob Remini with him from the University of Illinois at Chicago, and the excitement in that room was of listening to someone who has something to say, knows how to say it, and makes it very interesting, the ultimate definition of learning. It was a great, great, great part of what this club should be all about. And we strive so hard to do it every time. But when Steve Neal spoke, it really was, we hit a home run. So in the honor of Steve Neal, it is my great privilege to present Bernard Judge as the first recipient of the Steve Neal Award for Excellence in Journalism. Bernie. Put it right down there. Okay, I'll take it back. Uh, thank you very much, Paul. Did he call me a mixed blessing? <laughs> uh, first of all, it's a real honor for me to be here tonight. On this, in the same program with Minnie Minoso. I have to say it. I mean, even though John Rooney sitting at my table knows that I'm a Chicago Cubs fan, I have been a Minnie Minoso fan my entire career. I grew up on the South Side and I could only get to Comiskey Park. I didn't know where Wrigley was. So I saw you first and what a privilege it was. Uh, I'm honored uh, to uh, accept this award uh, in the company of uh, the Speaker of the House. Uh, my father, who, my late father, who is an Irish immigrant, if he was here, he'd say, uh, uh, in a brogue that got, got thicker as the night progressed, he'd say, uh, well, he's a bloody Republican. But he is Speaker of the House. 
And that's a big job. So do good for him if you can, Bernie. As a journalist, I am, I am truly honored to be in the same company with Pam Zeckman, who will be getting a, re a reward later. Uh, uh, Pam and I worked together when, when we were at City News. We worked together at the Tribune. Uh, she won two Pulitzer Prizes at the Tribune. Uh, I was the city editor for one of them. And my function as a city editor at the Tribune when Pam was doing a project for me was to help her in any way that I could and stay the hell out of the way. So Pam, I look forward to your award tonight. Um, the next thing I'd like to do, if you have a moment, is I'd like to introduce uh, uh, Steve Neal's uh, wife, Sue, uh, who's with us tonight, and uh, uh, their daughter, Erin, who's graduating from, from Northwestern University in the weeks to come. Sue and Erin, please stand. <laughs> Steve was my uh, friend uh, first, and also he was my colleague. I had the good fortune uh, to work with Steve, both at the Chicago Tribune and at the Chicago Sun-Times. Uh, and in, in the intervening years, our friendship was maintained. Uh, he, uh, he died uh, two and a half months ago uh, at the age of 54, ending a career that is uh, second to almost no one in this town, if anyone, and second to very few in the country. Um, Steve, uh, starting in the late 80s, when he was at the Sun-Times after a successful career at the Tribune that included being the White House correspondent for the Chicago Tribune. When he came to the Sun-Times, he started his column there. And for 17 years, <clears throat> he wrote three times a week. Even when he was on vacation, he filed three columns in the bank before he went on vacation. He was always on top of his job. But while he was amassing this amazing uh, uh, record of columns, and sensitively written columns and important columns. He was also writing books. Uh, during his 30-year career, he was involved with 11 books, six of which he wrote and five of which he edited. And they were primarily and almost exclusively historical or, uh, or they were biographical, political biographical. His last book on the uh, 1932 Democratic Convention in Chicago in which FDR was uh, nominated for President of the United States will be coming out in July, just in time for our two uh, political conventions, that great, you know, we don't know who's going to win, do we, in those conventions, no, for vice president. Um, anyways, uh, he, this last book of his may be his most important because while Steve has established himself, had established himself among the top rank of journalists, in recent years he has been establishing himself and truly is among the top rank of historians in this country. And, uh, on behalf of Steve Neal, uh, I accept this reward, uh, and I'll do the best I can to live up to it. And finally, I'd like to thank the, the City Club for uh, making me part of it this evening. And if I may take a personal note, I would like to thank Jay Doherty. Thank you very much. Hey, Bernie, Bernie, Bernie. Thank you, Bernie, very much. I now would like to uh, catch my place, uh, introduce the chairman of the City Club of Chicago, uh, a shy retiring gentleman who's aging gracefully and without much controversy, walking that middle of the road, Tom Roser. What do I do? Why do you to okay. Thank you very much. And we're, as history is being made here today, it's my honor and deep privilege to introduce a man whom I feel is probably of his age and of all ages, the great, uh, the pinnacle of what Chicago really means. For many years, he ministered to the unfortunate. And at the age of 75, an age which I can sympathize with today, he started an institution. He is, in fact, the greatest Chicagoan living today. I ask you to give a hand to Monsignor Ignatius McDermott.
Well, it's a privilege to be here tonight. I recall being in the company of Minnie Minoso the day after he was traded to the Cleveland Indians by the Chicago White Sox. And I asked Minnie where he was when he heard of the trade. And he said he was in Little Flower Church saying a prayer. So too bad your prayers weren't heard, Minnie. You're a living legend in Chicago, and we should run in, we should put you on the program as potential governor. Aww. So you're a great hitter in your day, Minnie, and you've always made a hit with me, and we thank you for, and thank the Lord for having blended our paths on the base paths of life. And may the happiest days of the past many in your life be the saddest of the future. Thank you. This is for you, many. Take it, and we'd like to hear you give us some uh, sort of a charge for the future. Many but also. Thank you. Thank you very much. Seemed to me like it was May 1st, 1951. When I first come to Chicago, that I don't know anybody, that I don't know what to do. It happened, I look around, see if I see anyone like me, and I don't see anyone, just me. Because I was the first black who played for the city and happy that God, together with the Father, they gave me a look at the first picture I hit a home run in the center field. And since to them, everyone know me right away to now 50 years. And I still, the guy, that you show your love and your respect to me. Please, I want to thank you for that. I don't know how to say it. thank you because I don't know how to speak it very well to express to you my appreciation. But I want to take this opportunity to say that Chicago, how did it call? Chicago. City Club, I put it from front back. I want to thank you to give me the opportunity to present to you and say thank you very much to my loving, loving wife. Everything, and I do every move I make it because she gave me her inspiration and her love. My wife and Mr. Minosa here. And I have a friend back up there that they were me since then, Mr. Jim and his wife from this Naples Bureau. They sit in the back, but they're there and they hear me. And for those gentlemen and ladies that I used to call Raulita and Fidelito, Mr. and Miss Cabrales, Tony Cabrales. They my friend. And I love you. The same way I love you. Please, I want everyone here tonight 
to remember that and have this in your heart. I love you. I respect you. And I remember when I'm nobody, nobody know who I am. I don't know what to go. I don't know how to speak. You offer me your love, your respect, and I'm here. And I was an American citizen, and I gave my life for America and for you. One way or the other, in the street, make an appearance, but I love you, because you were me. And you give me inspiration to be myself. Please, thank you. And my name, my wife, and my family, and my son, they can make it because he's kind of sick. But he told me, Daddy, don't forget to tell them I love you. And to the White Sox, please, root it for and root it for the cop. We're not against anybody. We are one city, second city, to have two teams. Let's fill it out, both park. Ah, when we play against each other, you take your team. I live at 3700 LA, close to regular field. I never went to the ballpark, but I was in the this all this time. But I root it for. God bless you. And God bless you, everyone. You have my love, my respect, and please, Let's give you mentally one second to those people who lost their life on September 11th in New York. I'm with it. That's what you see my fly in my car. American, you're going to see my American fly. So please, just protect the country the best. With all my respect to a different country, to those people, just give it a pray. Thank you very much, and God bless you, America. And God bless you. Good old number nine. Okay, we're getting close. Our next award for, once again, in the name of someone who's been very dear to our city club, the late John McDermott, someone who uh, was the moral guidepost between Roser and myself, and if you don't think that's a tough job. Uh, tonight's award goes to someone we all know, Someone who used to, as I understand it, used to ice skate on the southwest side of Chicago. <laughs> used to ice skate with my wife at the uh, Kirby Rink. Uh, I, I know all these stories. And someone who, read her bio, but anyone who's watched television in Chicago, one of the great moments is watching this recipient chase down some big thug as he's racing down the street, frightened to death that she'll catch up. And when she does, she faces him down with a microphone and uh, not exactly a tall person, but somehow the guy shrinks to her size. Ladies and gentlemen, the John A. McDermott Award for Distinguished Social Leadership goes to Pam Zeckman. That introduction brings to mind the way I spent my morning today at, uh, back at uh, Criminal Courts Building at 26th and Cal, which is exactly where I started out my career 30 years ago. Haven't made much progress, have I? Um, for City News Bureau. And there I was this morning uh, with a CBS camera person who was a woman my size, and we were chasing down yet another subject for another CBS story coming up, watch CBS too. Um, and we were two women uh, trying to get an interview with uh, some people that had a particularly violent background and one was 
six foot two and about 300 pounds, and the other one was not much smaller. And it was quite a scene at 26th and Cal. People wonder how we do that, and usually we have a big cameraman, and this time it was the two of us, but we got the interview. The story, my appearance at, at 26th in California made me think about my career and this evening, and the only way I ever succeeded in this business was because of all of the cooperation and the help and the support from a long line of bosses, both in print and at uh, CBS, where I've been for the last 23 years. The type of award that I'm getting tonight um, is very appropriate, and I want to thank the City Club of Chicago for it, because I did start out after getting out of college with a bachelor's degree in English literature, which prepares you for absolutely no jobs at all, <laughs> um, thinking, OK, I'll try social work. And my first job was as a social worker for the Cook County Department of Public Aid, supposedly advising people uh, adopting babies on how to handle the adoption, the adoption and the adoptive baby when, when he or she came home. And I knew absolutely nothing about that. I was totally untrained. But we did have a hint of baby selling when I was doing this uh, job, lawyers that were selling babies. And after I realized that I really was nothing more than a clerical worker, I decided to try journalism. And lo and behold, I had instant knowledge of people in town that were selling babies. And that turned out to be one of the big stories of my career at the Sun-Times. Posing as a pregnant woman wanting to sell a baby, and I threw in the ice skating too to help, saying that I was still ice skating, um, we were able to uh, expose baby selling rackets based on the knowledge that I had from my social work and able to write an awful lot of abuses that were going on uh, and stop a lot of baby selling that was going on in this town. My, my career has been a progression of being thrown into some pretty odd jobs as I worked undercover for various projects. Some of you may remember the Mirage Tavern series um, we opened a bar to document corruption in Chicago. I barely drink. I have a glass of wine, and there I was behind a bar having people take orders for margaritas that I had absolutely no idea how to make. Perfecting the salt around the rim was a real challenge for me. Um, I have found myself thrown into a variety of situations. Fred Astaire Dancing School was a real treat. Not a very good dancer either. Got two weeks of ballroom dancing instruction in order to learn how that scam worked and then proceeded to forget all of it um, after the story ran. Since I've been at Channel 2, um, thanks to the support of a wonderful team of uh, people that I work with, my current team is here tonight, um, we've been able to do an awful lot of stories that many of you out in the audience know about because you have reacted to them, you have enacted in forums, you've pushed for legislation, you've pushed for action to be done, um, and it has been that kind of reaction to our stories, I think, that has made journalism a wonderful tool for me to be able to make some of these social reforms that, as a social worker, would never have happened. Uh, I want to really thank everybody at Channel 2, especially um, the current management, Carol Fowler, my news director, and uh, jo Joe Ahern, the general manager. Um, without their support, we couldn't do the work that we do. And I thank the City Club for this honor. It is truly wonderful. Thank you. My wife did ice skate with you. She the 73rd in Washington. For those of you out of towners, the definition of hell for a politician is to have Ms. Zeckman chasing you down the street with a microphone. <laughs> that, is, that is truly. Well, we're now at the point of the program where I introduce a congressman who will introduce our citizen of the year. For some of you who are from out of town, he is the congressman from the third district of the, uh, of the state of Illinois. For those of us in the know, he is the 23rd Ward Committeeman, Honorable Bill Lipinski. Congressman.
on behalf of my wife, Rosemary, and I, we wish to uh, congratulate uh, uh, Dr. Black, our good friend Tom Donovan, uh, Bernie Judd, one of my favorite White Sox players of all time, Minnie Minoso, and Pam Zeckman on the awards that they received tonight. Uh, tonight was the first night I've ever met Pam Zeckman, and I'm very happy she didn't pop up with a microphone and a camera. I believe that the, the date for tonight's event uh, was uh, finally decided upon uh, by the uh, man of the year here uh, in Washington, D.C., a night when uh, Speaker Hastert, uh, myself, the Speaker's right-hand man, Mike Stokey, and our late and dear friend uh, Steve Neal had dinner in Washington, D.C. Uh, Steve had talked to me a number of times about this evening and talked about uh, having the speaker here tonight. And I believe that night we had dinner out there in Washington is the night it was finally put together. But uh, I have a great honor this evening uh, to introduce a man who uh, I have known since he uh, came to Congress, uh, a man who I believe uh, was the perfect choice at the perfect time to be the speaker of the United States House of Representatives. Uh, I believe that he has done an outstanding job in that position. Uh, he is one of the easiest people in the world to get along with. That doesn't mean he doesn't have strong views or that he doesn't have strong convictions. He certainly does. But he doesn't try to steamroll anyone. He doesn't try to only have the first, last, and only word in a conversation. He's a man who sits and listens. He's a man who tries to bring uh, people together. He always talks about himself being a coach and bringing people together to move the whole operation forward in a positive manner. He does all of those things. And I have to take a little credit here myself in that the day that Bob Livingston announced that he was not going to run for Speaker of the U.S. House because everyone was sure he was going to succeed uh, Newt Gingrich. I happened to be on the floor that day uh, when Bob Livingston got up and made the announcement he wasn't going to run. And I have to say in all candor, I went across to the other side of the aisle and I was looking for your award recipient tonight, but I couldn't find him. But I did find one of his colleagues, one of my colleagues, Ray LaHood. And I told him I was looking for Denny Hastert. And the reason I was looking for Denny was because I was sure he was going to be the next speaker of the House, and I wanted to be the first one to congratulate him. Well, unfortunately, I wasn't the first one, but I knew that he was the man to be speaker. And as I say, he's done an excellent job as speaker, but he has also done an extremely good job in taking care of the state of Illinois. And whether you come from southern Illinois, northern Illinois, eastern, western, the city, the suburbs, rural, he takes care of everybody in Illinois. He doesn't like to hear me say that, or other people say it, because any time I say it, he says, you know, the more you say that, the less I'm going to be able to do. <laughs> but I think we are here tonight totally among friends. And I'm sure no one is going to go back to Washington, D.C., unless Shimkus over there does it, and tells, <laughs> tell anyone what I had to say. Denny, as I say, I've known for a long time. We've worked together on many, many projects. Uh, he's a, a man who I respect tremendously. And I want to quote to you uh, the words that he said when he became Speaker in the House, and he addressed uh, the members of the House, and he addressed the nation at large. Solutions to problems cannot be found in a pool of bitterness. They can be found in an environment in which we trust 
one another's word, where we generate heat and passion, but where we recognize that each member is equally important to our overall mission of improving the life of the American people. And I believe that's his credo, and I now want to present to you the Speaker of the United States House of Representatives, the Honorable Dennis Hastert. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Thank you for that uh, very kind introduction. Bill and I have been friends for a long time, and in the game of politics, if you can have some good friends, especially on the other side of the aisle, it uh, is very, very heartwarming and uh, very rewarding. Matter of fact, Bill and I kind of come out of the same background. Bill uh, grew up, of course, in Chicago. I grew up out in the country. It was really country back then. Now we're the suburbs. Uh, you know, the collar counties, but uh, when I was a kid, coming to Chicago meant getting in a truck and going to the stockyards. And seriously, that's what it was all about. And uh, so uh, my, uh, my appreciation for this city and this place goes back a long, long way because going to Chicago and going to the stockyards meant how you made your living. And if it wasn't for that city, it wasn't for the stockyards, a lot of our good people people that I grew up with, my family, you wouldn't have had a living. So, you know, the, the rural, the countryside and the city for a long, long time have had this, this relationship that if one does well, the other does well. I look across this room and again, uh, looking at Bill. Bill grew up, uh, served as the, uh, in the park district, uh, coached. I grew up, uh, got out of college uh, and, uh, taught for 16 years and coached for 16 years, and then uh, went into the legislature. Bill was elected to the Congress in 1983. I followed him in 1986. Of course, Bill's a lot older than I am, but uh, just a little. But anyway, uh, we, we've had that good relationship. I, I look across this room and a lot of good friends. Uh, Don Clark Netch, it's great to see you. Don and I uh, served in the legislature together. Don was the chairman of the uh, Revenue Committee, and I was a Republican leader on revenue uh, over in the House, and we sponsored I don't know how many bills together, but we really did. And then in 1984, a unique thing happened that uh, Don Clark Detch and I wrote the Public Utility Act and the telephone bill uh, during that period of time. We don't tell too many people that, but anyway, it was a great, uh, it was a great experience. And uh, you know, if you don't know it, I'll tell you that uh, Dawn and I probably come from different poles of the political spectrum. <laughs> but uh, she is a great person to work with, and that type of relationship, I think, goes a long, long way because we got good things done. I look, and uh, John Chimkus is here, and as well as uh, Bill and from the Congress, I appreciate him, and uh, we do have a congressman from Oklahoma here, and uh, you know, I thought it'd be good for him to come and just see how Chicago really works. <laughs> you know, uh, Though we come from different political parties, we're on the same page when it comes to working together and to get some things done for Illinois and Chicago land, and whether you're talking about upstate or downstate, uh, we understand what the needs of our state are. And it doesn't make a lot of difference what that administration is in Springfield. We've always been able to work together. And I think I learned that uh, going back a long, long time ago. When I first came to Congress, Bill was relatively young, new in the Congress, and uh, we had people like Bob Michael from Peoria, uh, who was Republican leader, Dan Rostenkowski, and down right down the line. And you know, they always had different opinions and different ways of doing things. But Illinois, when it came to doing things for Illinois, the party politics, the party labels kind of fell away. And people joined together and did what was best for the state and for the people of the state. I think that's a great tradition. So, uh, Bill, it's certainly an honor to serve with you, and I thank you for your kind words and your great introduction.
The, I want to thank the City Club President, Jay Doherty, and uh, Tom Roser. Thank you. Tom, did you hear what he said about bloody Republicans huh? a little while ago? We'll just take that for the record. But anyway, we've got to live through that, don't we? But, uh, and uh, uh, thank you for, for putting on this evening and, and honoring these great people. For me to stand on the podium and to be at the same time and be honored with a great, great person like Minnie Minosa, somebody I uh, watched when I was a young man, a kid, Minnie, I have to admit, <laughs> that uh, when you first came here, what a great hero and what a great honor to be uh, here and share some time with you tonight. The city is certainly fortunate to have an organization like the City Club promoting thoughtful, nonpartisan discussion of issues. And I appreciate your efforts because you look at those issues. You know what's needed, not only by the city, but also by the surrounding areas in the state. And you come from a lot of different positions and a lot of different angles, from markets, from manufacturing, from banking and uh, all the, those education, all those very, very essential uh, elements that it takes to make a great and dynamic city and a great and dynamic state. This group has had a long and proud tradition dating back more than a century now of providing a forum where the challenges uh, facing our communities are <clears throat> dissected and discussed openly and honestly. These meetings not only help shape and define individual views on issues, but also provide a, f a forum for problem discussion is a vital part of our political process. It's a privilege to be named Citizen of the Year by this group, and I respect that so much. And I thank you for this tremendous honor. I remember getting a phone call at home a few months ago and uh, to talk about this recognition by the City Club and uh, the person on the other end of the line was Steve Neal, who was working on a column about the event. And I uh, know that many of you know, knew Steve well and, and personally, and so it will come as no surprise to you that after we talked for a while about Illinois, about Congress, and about politics, our conversation turned to another love of his, history. And specifically, we talked about the various people who had served as Speaker of the House over the years, and specifically those who represented Illinois, and there were only two others. Now, as a former history teacher myself, I like to think that I can hold my own in nearly any conversation about history, and particularly when it comes to political history. But I must admit, Steve had me beat. He was ratting off information about each of these people like he was there when they served, uh, from their personality to their leadership style, he knew what he was talking about, and he enjoyed sharing his knowledge. This was typical of Steve. He was a guy who was generally excited about his subject matter, whether it was politics or government or history, and he always wanted to share. And that's what made him a great columnist, and that is what made him such an enjoyable person to talk to and work with. And like many of you, I will miss my conversations with Steve and the legions of people across this state who regularly turn to his column will greatly miss his work. He was a throwback of sorts, one of the few old school reporters who still covering politics. And although he's gone, he leaves a legacy that will not soon be forgotten. Interestingly, interestingly one of the last things I talked to Steve about was the reauthorization of the federal transportation bill and what it means to Illinois. And that's a topic that I'd like to discuss a bit more with you this evening. As many of you know, we have been working in Congress to come to a consensus on a six-year federal transportation bill. Uh, bill Lipinski sits on the committee, uh, keeps me apprised. Uh, this legislation funds bridges, roads, and other much-needed transportation projects throughout the nation and dictates each state's rate of return on federal gas tax dollars that are sent to Washington. It's arguably the most important piece of legislation for the state of Illinois being addressed in Congress right now. 
This transportation bill is vital to maintaining and improving the tra transportation infrastructure. But when looking at our state's transportation needs, uh, existing in infrastructure is only part of the equation. We must also look to the future and the tremendous growth that is occurring throughout the Chicago land area. Uh, uh, growing brings unique challenges, particularly when it comes to transportation. And it's essential that we recognize and address those challenges today in order to avo avoid the congestion and the gridlock that also always comes with uh, additional residents. That's a subject that residents of my congressional district deal with daily. As some of you know, I represent the 14th congressional district. Uh, it's the suburbs. It starts in the far west suburbs of places like Naperville and Wheaton and Warrenville. You've seen it on the map if you haven't been there. It goes through the, the Fox Valley of Illinois. And I actually go farther west in my district than the Quad Cities. There's a little you know, piece of Illinois that sticks out farther west where the Mississippi River goes. My district goes there. So I cover the whole uh, north central uh, stretch of Illinois. Now I have to tell you, there's not a lot of folks out there. There's a lot of cornfields and bean fields and just a few small towns. But when you look at that diverse area and that diverse needs of this district, uh, it's something to really look at and, and uh, try to understand. Um, this is a subject that the residents of my congressional district have to deal with every day. Some of you know, uh, in those counties of Kane and Kendall that I represent, both of those counties are recently uh, named among the fastest 100 growing counties in the nation. In fact, the population of Kendall County alone has increased by 22 uh, percent since 2000, making it the 10th fastest growing county in the whole nation. And that tends to show no signs of slowing down. And just the opposite, Kane and Kendall counties are expected to grow from just more than 426,000 people combined in the year 2000, nearly over 700,000 people by the year 2025. Now, given those added uh, residents, it's essential that we uh, invest in new roads, bridges, and other forms of transportation to accommodate uh, the added traffic. Our ability to move forward on many of these fronts, however, depends on a great part of the pending transportation bill that we have in the Congress. And that's why members of the Illinois delegation are working side by side to pass legislation that reflects the unique challenges of our state. And I feel fortunate to be working with members who understand that this legislation speaks directly to the, fail to the future of our Illinois and our state and rises above partisan politics and geographic location of the state. And I'm pleased to report that we're making progress. As a matter of fact, I talked to the president uh, this uh, past week, uh, talked to members of the Senate, and I think we are well on our way of putting a bill together uh, in the next couple weeks. What I'm trying to get at, and I get you details about it, uh, transportation, and Bill and I can bore you to death about all the details, but really the fact is that I think there's a philosophy in our delegation that there's a synergy uh, and a cooperation between the suburbs and the city. A, a healthy, a vibrant, economically viable city of Chicago means healthy, vibrant, uh, thriving suburbs. And rural areas as well. If we can work together, we make our state better. It's not, you know, when I first came to legislature, you're downstate or your city. I think uh, that was back in the old days in Illinois, and I think we've passed that. I think we can work together. Now, we have other challenges. We need to do an energy bill. An energy bill in the Congress means that we can bring unlimited uh, resources and pipelines of natural gas right to Chicago's doorstep. We need to look at alternative sources of energy, windmills and wind power and uh, ethanol and all the other, soy diesel and all the other things that we can do. We also need to work with those states that produce energy to make sure that they're efficient and can do as much exploration and efficient uh, uh, transportation of that uh, energy product as possible. We have a long way to go. And of course, when we're looking at gasoline at uh, over $2 a gallon in some places and natural gas at over... Uh, you know, $5 per hundred and the cost going up and up, we need to come together. 
I was uh, one of the toughest things I had to deal with this year and last year was the failure of the energy bill to pass passed out of the House, passed out of the Senate, got a conference committee, got a conference committee out of the House, and over some procedural matters, we lost that energy bill. It didn't pass in the Senate. We need to redo that. We re need to have energy bill, and we need to pull together, and we need to have the whole Illinois delegation working together to make sure it gets done. Now, representatives of the House and Senate will meet on all these issues. Uh, we're working on the budget to finish the budget. Uh, the budget means how we deal with ed issues on education, transportation, health care, uh, on an infinitum. It's about a $480 billion uh, in non-defense, uh, non-homeland security issues, and really is the driver for a, a great deal of the things that we do in this economy. I could go on and talk about what, we're, what our job is in the Congress and what we're trying to do. And all of it has some relation to what we do in the city of Chicago and what we do in the state of Illinois. But the fact is that if we can put aside partisan labels from time to time and work together, as we have been able to do in the Illinois, uh, uh, Illinois delegation in the U.S. Congress, we can get great things done. I thank this institution, this Chicago uh, legacy, for being able to put people together, to discuss good ideas, come up with solutions, and then uh, is in, in evenings such as this, honor those people who have done a great deed for this, this city. Thank you very much. Thank you for being with us. God bless you. Meeting adjourned.